Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all here. This is cool. It looks like 30 folks already. Um, yeah, welcome. And thanks for coming by on short notice. Just decided this morning that it felt like there'd be some time this evening to sit down and try to answer some questions and chat with folks. I don't have a real particular agenda about what to cover tonight or what we're going to talk about. So uh, I'm just open to seeing some questions and seeing how it can be helpful. So feel free to shoot some questions. I'll try to be, rather than um, just very superficially and quickly answering things, I'll try to go a little bit more in depth. So if you ask a question and I'm, I miss it, then you can always repeat it a little bit later on or just kind of go with the flow. Um, so I'll take a look over here and hello to you lovely folks out there. It's nice to see you. Uh, I see a question here uh, from Cletus. Uh, what are your thoughts on milkweed? I recently learned that it's edible at four stages from early spring until late summer. Yeah, milkweed seems like a really wonderful plant. We've yet to work with it as a food, um, but it seems quite compelling. Definitely a nice hardy perennial. Seems really useful for a wide range of creatures. So, uh, and it grows wild. Seems like a, a wonderful companion to work with. Let me know what you find out. Couple folks from Nova Scotia here. That's cool. Um, boy, some questions are starting to come in. All right. Uh, Glenn asks, have you ever tried guinea fowl for controlling ticks? And hi from upstate New York as well. Um, that's where we are. We've never worked with them. We have other friends that grow or raise uh, guinea fowl and find them to be useful, but we haven't worked with them. So I, I'm not sure that I have much to offer there. Oh, I'm just going to see if I clean my lens. Does that work? Um, Charles is asking, uh, I remember you made an insect hotel by drilling holes in a dead tree last year. How did that work out? Uh, do you have any issues with woodpeckers pecking out the inserts? Yeah, so we, we tried drilling a whole bunch of holes into some dead standing trees in the hopes of it being attractive to mason bees. And I'll be perfectly honest, I haven't actually looked closely to see if any have gone in there. Uh, it's a good reminder, maybe this spring I can take a look and see, but doesn't seem to hurt to try. If the tree's already dead, you can drill holes. And worst case, if uh, bees do go in there and wood woodpeckers find them, it's good food for the woodpeckers. So it's just lots more micro habitat. Seems always worth the effort. Um, boy, we're getting more and more folks in here. We got over 50 now. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And I will keep looking here to see how I can be helpful. Any interest in adding other livestock to your setup, i.e. bees and pigs? Pigs, probably not. We're just too uh, small and complex to be able to do so. Bees, uh, I raised bees way back when in top bar hives and I really enjoyed them. And Sasha and I have been really keen to reintroduce bees this year. And I got some plans for uh, ware hives that I'm really interested in trying to build if I can make the bandwidth this winter. And certainly if uh, we do get bees. We will be documenting what our experience is like with that. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, David Taylor, oh, you're a member. Thanks for being a member. Appreciate it. A couple of years ago, you did two mushroom spawn inoculation videos. I'm curious what your yield was. I've debated trying North Spore, and it looked like fun. Um, yeah, we ordered some inoculating tools from North Spore. I think they're out of Maine. They seem like a nice new outfit. We've always ordered our spawn from fieldforest.net and have been really happy with them over the years. Um, the wine caps that we grow always grow beautifully. Um, the shiitakes, we had a really dry year, so it was pretty limited production, but we'll have to see. Um, we'll give them a good soak in the spring and maybe they'll pop up, but it seems like it's always worth experimenting with mushrooms, I think. Um, yeah, Dave Agami is asking, uh, I'd love to hear what you do about insect pests, especially weevils like plum and apple cuculio. How do you design to prevent loss to insects? For better or worse, we don't really get involved in that. We've cast a very wide plant net and so uh, and we also really support wild predator 
uh, little predatory wasps and the like. And so just kind of trust that the ecosystem will figure it out. But we also get losses, you know, plums that don't form up and that kind of thing. So could be missing an opportunity to be way more thorough and thoughtful in how we manage those trees. But uh, normally it's pretty hands off and it works well enough. Um, let's see. Matt's asking, do you have any advice for starting hot compost this time of year, late winter, early spring with below freezing nights, but gradually warming days? Yeah, I'm going to be uh, sharing way more notes on our compost heating experiments. We, I just set up two more today. And uh, it seems like a really great time of year, especially next to high tunnels or in greenhouses to provide nice heat to buffer early spring seed starts from particularly cold nights. Um, yeah, I think even material that's been frozen. One thing you could do if you ever take a bath or something like that is when you get out and you've got hot water, use that to water your compost piles that haven't woken up yet and give them, you know, it's instead of wasting the water, you can take that hot water and use that to, to like trigger. Um, and if you've got particularly cold times and the material is not hot yet, consider insulating with burlap sacks or hay bales or uh, some sort of container around with some insulative hay or the like to get the, the temperature up. Um, let's see here. Any morels? We have not found morels on our property. That would be pretty darn neat. If you ever want to trade, let us know if you've got some nice dried ones. Um, just bouncing around here. Wolfbird Homestead is asking about uh, syntropic agroforestry. Yeah, so I'm familiar with the term and I think I'm vaguely familiar with the concepts, but I'll be honest, I don't know enough about it to speak to it. So I'll leave that one for other folks to uh, share some notes if they have worked with syntropic agroforestry and like it. Um, Doormat, thanks. Thanks for kicking in. I appreciate that. Yeah, if if you feel inspired, there's the super chat thing. It's I'm very happy to do these live streams, um, and but if people are interested in kicking in a little tip here or there, that's always helpful. Kind of keeps it um, exciting to do this. So thanks, Matt. So signing my lease on a half acre next week. Thanks for inspiring. That is exciting. I really hope you have some wonderful success growing this year, Matt, or Door, Mr. Matt. Um, Small seeds writes, uh, hi, Sean, and hello to all. I'm starting to plan out the garden and have a bunch of space around my elder trees. Any herbaceous plants you would suggest that seem to do well growing with elder? That's a good, good question. Elderberry is tough. They're wonderful, exquisite beings, uh, but they are very, very thirsty and hungry plants. And so you definitely would want plants that are very tolerant of deep, deep shade. Um, around our elders, some of the plants that do pretty well. We've got violets growing under some elders and they're, they seem quite happy. Uh, I've got an elder patch that to the south and west of them, a stinging nettle patch seems to be doing really well. Makes it really fun to harvest elders, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, you really wanna look at those, those plants that are self-sufficient and very shade tolerant. And I could imagine some of the mentha, like a bee balm or a lemon balm, uh, maybe some uh, peppermints being willing to grow under them. Just experiment and see. But you can expect that in if they're needy and really enjoy full sun, that they're gonna be, have a very tough time underneath elderberry. But I'm glad you're trying to think about adding that extra layer. Um, Brian asks, any experience with wild plums? Yeah, we grow, we've got a bunch of wild plum shrubs. I, I'm still trying to understand what the heck is going on. We've got so many different varieties of plums going and it feels like each year we get almost no plums. I think it's a pollination issue, but there could be something way different that is going on there. But we've got little thickets of wild plums all over the main edible acre site uh, up in Trumansburg, New York. And I figure one of these years, we're just gonna be like swimming in plums out of nowhere. It'll be a nice surprise, but so far that hasn't been the case. Um, let's see. Okay, so gland alongside the stream that would provide edibles or habitat. Uh, really great 
recommendation. I'm going to, I always mention this one. I'm typing it in, but pfaf.org, uh, plantsforafuture.org. Really great search engine in there that lets you describe the context that you have and what sort of plants you're looking for. But there's certainly, if you've got a fair bit of sun getting into that area, um, elderberry, which we were just talking about, would be a great fit. Any and all of the willows do really nicely. Um, currants do just fine in there. If it's very, very sunny and wet, uh, I've noticed seaberry actually does just fine in that context. They, they seem to be okay with lots of water right around them. Um, if it's shady, that's a whole other thing. If very, very shady, you could even consider maybe doing some mushroom log production or inoculating wood chips with uh, mushroom types like wine cap. Um, any tips for mugwort? Asks Swam Swam Lizard. Um, well, I'm not sure if I know what you mean. I mean, ways to work with mugwort as a really awesome medicinal plant or nutrient accumulator or tips because it's challenging to you. We grow mugwort on a couple patches and it is rambunctious and pretty tough to manage, um, but it's a pretty wonderful plant. I used to make, I would cut mugwort uh, in you know, like after the flowers had formed up and make these like four foot long smudge sticks. They were like thicker than a baseball, uh, baseball bat. And they were really great at parties, just have this like huge multi-acre smudge stick. So that's one, one use for mugwort. Someday maybe Sasha will make a video. She's made uh, mugwort beer that is really intense and interesting and wonderful um, with brown sugar and I think some yeasts and things like that. So that could be a, a, fun, a fun video later on. We're getting some questions coming through. All right. Uh, let me bounce around here. Doormat. Any tips on plants that attract good insects to combat pests or to interplant for pollinators? Um, yeah, so rather than giving a very specific list of, of pest consume, well, plants that provide nectar flow that supports those flying creatures that consume soft-bodied insects, in other words, like who are the flowers that help predator wasps? And rather than saying lists of them, what you want to look for are those sorts of plants that present flowers in, in umbels or very, very numerous and small flowers. So most predatory wasps have very small mouths. And so when you've got like a, a pea family or like a big, beautiful flower, it's less useful for those predatory creatures. So think about your yarrows and anybody in, um, you know, similar to carrot, like your Queen Anne's lace, your bronze fennels, your, your elecampane, those sorts of plants that have nice flat flowers that are easy to access. Those really support predatory wasps in a good way. Um, Ben Neb is asking, how do you balance variety of plants with efficiency at your nursery? I would say we don't balance it, that we are skewed heavily towards um, variety over efficiency by a long shot. And I know efficiency could really be beneficial in a lot of ways for our nursery, but it's just not so much in the cards for how we operate. Um, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's just variety over efficiency all day, every day. <laughs> um, Cletus is asking, yeah, and this is a great question. What are your most, uh, what are we most excited about right now with your own food production systems? I, well, we're, I think this year, what we're really striving to do is get a lot better at growing the food that we eat. Um, trying to increase our annual production quite a bit. So We'll be making some videos very shortly about our experiments uh, evolving with compost heating for the high tunnels. But I think we've got a few spaces now that are really ready to do seed starting in earnest. Um, and just our hope is to have so much excess food this fall that we can really share with other folks. We tend to have a few things that work out really well each year, but um, 
lots and lots of things that kind of fumble and, and disappear by the fall. So that's what we're most excited about is really dialing in our annual food production. Um, Daniel Soden is that how, uh, how's the rodent damage over there? Has the snow dropped enough to see some things better? Yeah, rabbit damage was phenomenal this winter. Uh, I'll make a video someday showing the amount of deer browse up at our main six acre site. It was just like mind numbing how much they consumed. So I'm just assuming the voles underneath the snow this winter um, ate proportionally a similar amount. It was a tough winter all the way around and we, whether we liked it or not, we provided a huge amount of diverse food for the Rodentia crew to get through this winter and that's okay. But yeah, we're, we're gonna have way limited stock for this spring, uh, at least early on. So questions are definitely sneaking by me a little bit. So again, if I miss your question, uh, please feel free to repeat it a little bit later on. Um, one little thing I would offer up, I see a few folks here. Uh, right now I'm seeing Dave and Daniel and a few other people that are members and if you're interested in joining as a member of Edible Acres, it's really helpful to us to have a nice baseline of folks that contribute, you know, a dollar a month or two dollars a month or whatever works. Um, so if that's compelling to you, we would be thrilled to have you as a member. We did a, a members only video stream a few weeks ago and we'll probably do another one soon enough. So there are nice little perks there, but it really supports us directly. So it'd be cool if you wanted to do that. And Cliffside Permaculture, thank you so much. Welcome to the herbaceous layer. It's really nice of you. Um, Chainsaw ASMR is asking, do you think you can convince Akiva to write another book? I don't think he needs convincing. He, he'll, he'll, he's gonna do whatever he wants to do. We hung out the other day and just caught up on things and that was really nice. Um, but yeah, he's, he's doing, he's, he's working on what he's working on. It feels like lately Akiva has been really enjoying just being present out in the woods and doing the work that he's doing. So but I'm glad you asked. Thanks, Glenn. Nice to have you aboard on the herbaceous layer. It's cool to see you. Um, all right, let's see if I can get to some more questions here. Um, no, I think I'm okay. Newer member to your channel. Hi, Mary. Do your chickens eat scraps and, uh, or do you supplement with chicken feed? Yeah. So Mary's question, do, what do we feed our chickens basically? We don't ever buy commercial chicken feed. We bought a few bags way back when uh, and they never really liked it. The layer feed was expensive and they didn't seem to go for it. So we soak grain, uh, whole grain, mainly millet, sunflower and whole wheat is, or uh, winter wheat is the main things we offer to them along with uh, as much food scraps as we can. And that's worked out pretty nicely. It's it, we. It's not as though they desire commercial feed and we withhold it. We've given that option, but they just don't seem to like it compared to soaked grain and food scraps. So, um, doormat, thanks. Boy, folks are, are signing up. I really appreciate it. Don't feel any pressure. I don't want anyone ever, ever, ever to feel like there's pressure to join or something like that. If, but if you're excited to do so, that's really awesome. Um, Cool. Let's see here. Um, bear with me. I'm just going to scroll through just a little bit and see. Okay. Copperhead Road Homestead. I'm trying to make a living fence out of black locust cuttings, not root cuttings. I've Googled it, but not found much info on it. Thoughts? I would, well, I wish you luck in experimenting with it, but I wouldn't put a ton of effort into it. Black locust, I've never seen strike um, roots or make roots from hardwood cuttings. You can experiment with taking root cuttings, but you may also look for getting seed and doing hot water scarification and grow them out from seed for a year and have a whole pile of beautiful seedlings. That's probably the most resilient way to go. But look at other plants as well. Black locust is a little tricky in that it spreads in suckers. so it might not be as uh, controllable of a living fence as you may want. So look at some other options before you commit there. Uh, Patreon, I looked into it. I, I would prefer in a way to go that route, but 
it just felt too complex. It's already, there's so many moving parts managing all the comments on the YouTube uh, area that having a whole other platform to manage felt just tricky. So the membership route seemed reasonable. Hopefully it's it's good. Um, okay, Tremont. Hi, Edible Acres. Uh, my partner and I love your videos. Thank you, we really appreciate you um, watching. We currently live in a city, but in, a f in future want to have some land and a permaculture inspired garden. What would you recommend we do and learn now? That's a really neat question. And I feel like that probably applies to a lot of folks. Uh, you know, someday we love to be on land. Right now we're renting or right now we're not exactly where we think we want to be. Some options. Well, first of all, keep researching, watching videos and getting books and getting excited and getting your dreams evolving. Uh, are there community garden plots that you can rent and do some small annual gardening this season? Are there cool, small, organic, or otherwise farms that you can volunteer? Are there food justice organizations that need extra help uh, or the potential to plant food forests on public land and you know your energy can help move that forward? So I feel like there's lots of options there uh, if you put out to folks that you're interested in growing and you're willing to volunteer, there are many people that would be excited to have you there. So I wish you all the best in finding a beautiful forever home when the time is right. Um, let's see. Yeah, a couple questions. I feel like people have... Um, been chatting here a little bit about black locust. Starting them from cuttings, I I would encourage if you try that, go put small put a small number of eggs in that basket. Try it from seed. That's really the way to go, I, I believe. Or root cuttings, and we'll be sharing notes. I got some neat tricks from my friend Buzz uh, Buzz Fervor up at Perfect Circle Farm. We were just chatting on the phone the other day, and I'll I'll share what he shared with me about how to get root cuttings to root really uh, in a really strong way. Um, ooh, Dylan G, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I'll answer your question then go back up a little bit. Any vegetable or herbs that you have found not compar uh, compatible, I'm guessing, with the deep mulch or Ruth Stout method? Yeah, that's a good question. So. Deep mulch, I mean, it really, like, what's the mulch? Is it really, really loose hay, as an example, which is what Ruth Stout seems to uh, seem to work with the most. Really loose hay is very much conducive to vole habitat. So if you were to do incredibly loose hay with um, beets and carrots and other crops that voles really enjoy eating, you could expect a fair bit of loss early on. Uh, wood chips seem a little less to... Um, compatible for voles, but as far as plants themselves and being willing to grow, I don't know that I can think of, I'll keep it in the back of my mind, but for the most part, most plants enjoy healthy fungal living, even moisture soil, and mulch seems to promote that. So uh, by and large, I think it's a reasonable thing, especially for perennials. Um, okay, let me just bop around here. Yeah, so we've got over 120 folks, so the questions are coming at a rate where I will try my best. But again, if you put a question and you uh, and it's missed, feel free to, to try it again. Uh, interesting question here, I've never heard of this. Rick. Uh, Nielsen is asking, have you tried soaking your chicken feed grain in diluted wood vinegar to increase the chicken's health and production? We have not. That sounds pretty neat. Um, I'm going to make a quick note and research that a little bit. Give me a second. Thanks for, thanks for asking that so that I could then learn about that. Um, Hey, Broad Shoulders Farm, I know you. Nice to see you here. Um, any experience or tips for growing horseradish in the orchard as part of a guild? Yeah, that's a really cool question. And I think it's a good thing to note that when we explore the concept of guilds, so for those, most of us here or a lot would be familiar, but for those of you that are not, 
a guild would be multiple plants grown together intentionally with the idea that they support each other. And horseradish has some really amazing value as far as being a really good rhizome barrier, keeping grass from growing in. Um, the challenge when you design something like a horseradish, let's say for example, horseradish under an apple tree, and you say, well, I want it to be a rhizome barrier and a dynamic accumulator and a predatory or a olfactory confuser for rabbits and deer, that's great. But then the harvestable part is the root. And so when you go to dig the horseradish next to your apple tree, you'd be hurting the apple tree. So there's some value in thinking through um, somebody like a horseradish, a rhizome barrier dynamic accumulator, if it is a root crop that you're looking for, you may want to consider them in their own area, or maybe horseradish being on the south of a Jerusalem artichoke patch as a guild, so that when you go to dig, because you're looking for digging to get the horseradish and the Jerusalem artichoke, so it's compatible for both of those, or with the mint root or things like that. So I just keep that in mind, if you're, if you're interested in the root, how do you design it so that you're not gonna hurt your keystone species? I hope that's helpful there. Um, Dylan, thanks again, my gosh. Um, have you tried any edible varieties from the Saratoga Tree Nursery Program? Thoughts? I'm afraid I haven't. Um, I guess that's what, like a DEC tree sale thing? Um, we, I don't think I've grown any of those trees out, to be honest with you. Um, Mark, you look so healthful. What do you eat on an average day? Thanks. I probably have a little bit of a rosy glow from Sasha's homemade um, rhubarb wine right here. Tastes like a white wine almost. So that, that might be what you're seeing there. I'm not sure. But uh, we eat really well. We Tonight we had some winter squash with ground venison. Uh, Sasha makes amazing meals all day, every day. Um, we eat our, the eggs that are chickens generate for us and I think that helps quite a bit. So thanks for thanks for that. Uh, yeah, it feels like home homegrown food as the main thing you eat day in and day out. If you're privileged enough or lucky enough to have a lifestyle that allows for that, goes quite a long way. Um, Sarah Shoemaker, I have some monkey balls, Osage orange seeds from fall. When should I start them? Yeah, cool question. Um, boy, lots of folks are interested in the living spiky hedge. I like it. So let's say you collected Osage orange fruits in the fall. The key with them that I've learned is you basically would leave them out, you know, in a container, but basically exposed to the fullness of winter. So I've got um, 50 or so of them in folding crates. I buried them under some snow so they didn't get the most extreme cold, but they basically will freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw all winter. By spring, they'll be these gross, beautiful, mushy, half-rotten, fermented goobers with the seeds inside. And you can then either pick the seeds out carefully or just take handfuls of that wonderful muck and pour it out and put it into nice, rich garden soil give them a little bit of space between the seeds and let them grow for a season. And they can get three feet tall in a good year, one to two feet tall if they're really close to each other. But that's the normal workflow is let them freeze and rot and thaw and freeze and rot and thaw and then smear them out in rich, full sun garden soil in the spring. I hope it works for you. Um, Austin Yorty, best blackberry varieties in your opinion. I really love, we've got a thornless blackberry. That's the one we offer on the website that I can't tell you what the name is. Um, I got it from somebody as like a weedy blackberry way back when. It's been reliable and thornless and growing beautifully for us for years. And the fruits get, I mean, like almost two inches long at, at peak. Um, so that's been really wonderful. But over time I'm learning they get hammered by deer and the thorny ones do not. So we're on the lookout for some named varieties of really good, super thorny blackberries that we can have more reliable production uh, what, after like a really desperate winter that deer eat lots of them. Daniel, yes, the wine is delicious. It's rhubarb. I mean, it's really neat to have 
I mean, like white grapes are cool and all that, but rhubarb is so much easier to grow. That's another video for the future. We've we've got. Oh yeah, Sasha was just mentioning. So this is a rhubarb wine where she used commercial yeast, and it's good. It's, it's nice. I like it a lot. It's like a nice white wine sort of flavor. But the ones where she used wild, uh, wild yeast that she, uh, she grew. Well, Sasha, do you want to come and explain? Since you mentioned it in the background, now she has to come and explain. So how did you make? <laughs> how did you make your? Now I forget. Your rhubarb <laughs> wine with the wild yeast. There were certain flowers you were using. I used lungwort and her. What the yeast did it? I just they know picked, yeah. picked them put them in a jar. Uh, but I don't. I, I well, we'll do a bit. We could do a video on that. I can't. All remember. right, we'll do we'll <laughs> do some videos on I'm that. I'm doing dishes. <laughs> Yeah, we plan on doing more video. I always say, I say this every time, but it's like Sasha will get into a, a cooking project and by the time it's halfway done, we're like, oh, we should have made a video on that. But we did that corn shelling uh, experiment. And so we've got huge bowls of corn and we definitely plan on uh, recording when, I think tomorrow she'll do the nixtamalizing of that corn or start that process. So we've got some more videos in the pipeline for sure. Um, all right. Marilyn Madden. Hey, Sasha, do we have plans on having kids in the future? Oh, man. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think we're... No. No. Sorry. But maybe I we... always thought if, if I had the financial wherewithal, I would adopt. Even as a little kid, I thought that. So, we, yeah, maybe... Me, well, we have talked about that kind of thing, like doing foster care or adopting, but the system is just so scary. I, I don't know. Well, that's a lot of information about our person. <laughs> there you go. We don't plan on having kids. We don't but, plan on having kids of our own. But maybe of, foster. Out of our bodies, probably not. Foster or adopting, potentially, if that feels like a thing we want to do. It would be cool if we had more folks around with little kids that we could hang with and help learn about the garden stuff we do, too. Yeah. <laughs> Bringing Sasha in for the random, random questions. Um, Sasha was involved when we did our members only live thing a couple of weeks ago. It was both Sasha and I. And we'll, we'll do another one where we just sit together or maybe one where it's mainly her or exclusively her for questions around cooking things. Um, Brian Palmer is asking, will currents produce fruit if my winters only get down to the high 20s. I can't say for sure. I think that seems reasonable. Um, there's no way to know until you try. But I mean, that's a, that's a pretty mild winter. They, they're definitely adapted to much colder uh, climates. But the fact that it does get down below freezing probably gives them some chill hours. You might want to find some spots that are on the cooler side as far as a microclimate goes. Um, but give them a shot. Ooh, that's an interesting question. Ryan Hooks, any thoughts on useful plants for protection from non-organic neighbors on a small plot? Keep up the good work. Thanks. Yeah, that's tough. I'm sorry you're dealing with that. Um, well, non-organic, it's a kind of a generic term. If they're using Roundup and things like that or, or chemicals that you don't want in your food supply, definitely makes sense to think about what are the really fast-growing, non-human-eating visual barrier sorts of plants. And so I, I go to what we worked with in our living wall as my default is I think giant miscanthus grass, really tolerant of toxicity. You're not going to ever eat anything on them and you can use that as a mulch to support them or uh, nearby. I might think about a whole bunch of willows in there or poplars or some nitrogen fixers, maybe black locust or honey locust to help repair that soil. Um, but not with the intent of eating any of the parts of those. Hopefully it gives you a couple things to work with. Um, thanks, Brian. Get those memberships up. Don't feel any pressure. If you're if you're excited to do it, I mean, this is really neat to see folks doing the, um, the super chat thing and a few new folks joining the membership. I'm definitely not doing the live sessions in order to promote that, but I also feel like it's okay to say that it does take a fair bit of time and energy with the channel. So when we get that sort of direct support, it does, it feels neat. But Madeline's one that sent us, is that Madeline? 
Madeline, thank you so much for the salve also. I've been using it on my wrist and it's really wonderful. So thank did, you. Did we see Madeline in Didn't here? Did Madeline ask that question? Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Well, well if Madeline, if, if, Madeline you're out there, if you're out there, thank you for the salve. <laughs> um, borrowing other people's kids is the best. Yeah. Yeah, we've got some really some wonderful friends with cool kids, and it feels really nice. I I, I like being around little kids, and I, it feels like there's a lot of them out there. So I don't know that we need to contribute more, um, but showing kids the sorts of systems that we're working with feels pretty special. So I'd like to do more of that. Um, yeah, let's see. Matt here is asking, do you graft apple scions onto seedling rootstocks or prefer named rootstock varieties? Any general thoughts on how seedling rootstock apples um, have done? Yeah, so I've done both. I've grafted, I don't do a lot of grafting. I'm, you know, I would consider myself a novice. I've grafted on Bud 118 and Antopnica, both you know, nice full size robust rootstocks and they do pretty well. Uh, what has done the best for me by a long shot are seedling apples of the ornamental crab apple that there's a huge one in our backyard and there's seedlings of them that pop up everywhere. And I've grafted over so many of those and someday this half acre is just gonna be jammed up with wild stands of like 60 different varieties of apples that are all on these rootstocks. Like the tree has an almost three foot diameter trunk at the base. I don't know what that future is gonna look like, but on seedlings, it seems like they're just rocket ships compared to uh, bench grafting and then setting them out in the garden. And then it's like finding wild trees and grafting right onto them just seems to be the best. Andrew Allen, thank you very much. Very much appreciate it. Um, wow. Flock Finger Lakes, hey, we know you. Thanks for, for joining us. Yeah, folks, check out the Flocks fin Flock Finger Lakes. They came out and uh, did a video interview with us. Probably they'll have a video out at some point, but um, search for them on YouTube. They're a crew that moved up from the city and are doing some neat work here in the Finger Lakes now. And they've got much much higher video production quality than, than we do and some interesting interviews and things like that. So you can check them out. Um, oh. Small seeds. So Sasha, yes, you did see it. Okay. Yeah, we've been using the salve and we, oh, that is Madeline. Okay, cool. I'm glad we made that connection. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. That was lovely. And I'm glad Sasha came in and, and yeah. said that. Yeah. yeah, it really helped. It held my wrist like fast. There you go. Thank you. Small seeds has a YouTube channel as well, right? Yes. Yeah, I think we, uh, Sasha's been checking, check out small seeds YouTube channel. Um, maybe small seeds, would you put, or Madeline, would you put a link to your YouTube channel in the comments here so folks can check out the really cool stuff you're doing with herbal medicine on your channel? It'd be great for people to see what you're up to and give her a subscribe. Yeah. Um, cool. Has Sasha considered putting together a cookbook? I'd buy that. <laughs> Probably not, but more videos. We've got to get, we've got to get I have her. thought about doing a cookbook, but it's just, it's hard. Everything I cook, I forget what I'd done once I did it. But I have a name for a cookbook that's really good. We'll keep it secret for now. <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to say it? No. No, she'll say it later or not at all. Um, okay. All right, getting caught up here and trying to find some more questions. Um, do you spare the time to read any books still or do you strictly spare that time to reading your lands? Laugh out loud, uh, Ben and Rubber. I personally, well, Sasha reads a, a lot and is always expanding her mind and educating herself. I, with the downtime between doing stuff outside and, and working, I tend to like watch silly, dumb videos for the most part. <laughs> Don't really do amazing depth of research. I, I tend to do that in, through direct experimentation rather than research. Um, so there's my answer. I watch like kitten farting videos when I have spare time. <laughs> um, 
Brian Zabel, thanks for all the help over the years. It's truly our pleasure. It feels really exciting and wonderful that there are this this many people, these many folks out there that are interested in what we do and hearing their stories about converting lawns over to food forests and all the different experiments people are up to. It's it's really wonderful. It's great great community that we feel like we're part of. Um, Flock Finger Lakes, what plants will you have available for purchase this spring? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, it's tricky. March 1st will be when I update the inventory for spring orders. And I just, I made a video about this setting expectations. We're, we're going to have the inventory super low uh, between rabbit brows and deer brows and I'm sure vol pressure and all that and just needing to get caught up on some other projects. Our, our shipping for the spring will be limited. Local and regional folks, we plan on doing a whole lot of bare root sales for local people a little bit later on, like mid-March or onward. And, and we'll make a video about that and or send a newsletter out where people can order. Um, and for those of you that are far away and interested in our plants, we really appreciate it. Uh, come back to us in the fall. I'll renew inventory September 1st and plan to have a huge amount of new plants to uh, offer. But you can also go on our website. It's edibleacres.org. And there's a permaculture nurseries list that shows a whole bunch of other rad nurseries. So we will not be offended in the least if you choose to get plants from other friends of ours. But thanks for that question. Um, cool. Jason asks, hi, Sean. Favorite or best nitrogen fixing bush? I love the channel. There are a bunch of neat ones. Some first that come to mind, uh, river locust or amorpha fruticosa is exquisite, beautiful, easy to manage shade tolerant, um, nitrogen fixer, really good for um, the bumblebees and the honeybees and the like. I personally love autumn olive and gumi. I know I always get some flack when I say I love autumn olive, but whatever, I'm, a, I'm an invasive too, so what are you gonna do? Um, but gumi is really nice. Siberian pea shrub is beautiful and a very strong nitrogen fixer. Uh, sea berry is pretty darn unruly and expansive, but wonderful in the shrub layer. Um, yeah, those are, those are what I got for now. <laughs> um, Amy, I feel like you've asked this question a few times and I missed it. Sorry. What do you think of red mulberries? Is it better than the white mulberries? Red, I believe is the one that's the native and white or Morris Alba, which end up actually being black fruits at the end, uh, are the non-natives. Uh, I don't know that I've ever eaten a explicit Morris rubra, rubra, the, the true native red mulberry. So I don't know that I can speak to that. Um, this is interesting. Two, two good questions in a row from Glenn. Do you think climate change is going to have an effect in your garden in upstate New York? I know that climate change has had an effect in our uh, growing. I've been growing for 16 years in this area and I've noticed things just unraveling. We get insanely dry years, insanely wet years, very, very late frost, incredibly early seasons without frost, way longer growing seasons, super early frost all over the map. It's just, it's unraveling. And so we're just trying to diversify all of our efforts as much as possible and try to learn and share notes with that. Uh, and your follow-up question I like too is in say 10 to 20 year time frame. what are your plans? Um, as far as the overall picture, you know, big picture nursery or business and all that, if there is an economy in 10 or 20 years, which remains to be seen, but I imagine our nursery evolving uh, or shifting into being less of a direct plant sale, plant sale sort of nursery and being more of a nursery nursery. In other words, that we have evolved into being in a position where we can mentor and facilitate and support other small folks and younger folks or people that are trying to move out of other career paths to get them kick-started to be their own permaculture perennial nurseries where they are and offering seeds and cuttings and consultation to that end. That's kind of where I see our business going, where we are going I don't know, but we plan to just keep, to the best of our ability, ramping up all the production that we do, making more interrelationships with other lovely folks and deepening our barter world as much as possible. Um, cool. 
Cool. This is fun. Um, so let me bounce around again. Andrew Cullen wanted to say uh, thank you for these Q and A's. Absolutely, my pleasure. I've been working for farms for six years now, but have but your live broadcasts have given me the inspiration to move forward on my own projects. That's really encouraging to hear, and thank you for or to read. So thank you for sharing that, and I really wish you a huge amount of luck in figuring out what's next. I think it's always important to draw attention. You know, we've been making I've been making videos now for eleven years. And uh, I have no formal education in agriculture or PDC or any other formal stuff. And just through experimenting and trying each year and sharing notes with folks and evolving little by little, making tons of mistakes, but getting a little bit better each year, it's evolved to where it is now. So um, I really, I truly feel like every, lots of folks can be pursuing these paths and you don't need to be indoctrinated or you know, go through some formalized route in order to begin. We're working on marginal land, on shared family land, on all sorts of um, non-formal, non-traditional uh, arrangements with people. So it, it can really work out. Um, okay. Quick question, Borean Wisdom here. Uh, are you aware of chestnuts resisting to extreme cold temps? Negative 40 uh, Fahrenheit Celsius. That's pretty darn cold. I don't know. I think chestnuts, certain uh, American chestnut is known to be the most cold hardy from what I understand of it. Um, I think negative 40, you'd be expecting some pretty serious dieback. So you want to do some research there. I think if you want nuts in that, per, that sort of climate, I would look at uh, hazelnut as being a little bit more resilient there. Um, oh, Eric asks, are you going to try grafting some of the rabbit damaged plants? More likely than not, a couple things we'll do. We may, if we have the bandwidth, um, inventory the numbers of plants that were damaged by rabbits and deer and offer them as seconds or grade B or something like, and be very clear. Like these are, these are plants that are incredibly alive and vibrant and, and beautiful and will grow wonderfully, but they've been chewed back by rabbits and deer. And so they're two bucks or they're three bucks. And so then you can grow them out yourself. We either will do that or we'll simply just leave them in the same place they were and they'll re-sprout. Basically it's a, a, a rough coppicing is what truly happened. It doesn't kill them. It just sets them back. So the nice two foot tall, three foot tall second year honey locust that we were going to sell for $15 is now two inches tall, but it'll be three feet tall again in the fall and it'll be a, even one year older in the root system. So it's either a patience game or trying to find alternative markets for those damaged plants. And to not get so stressed out about it because the rabbits and the deer, they need to live too. And we're calling ourselves a permaculture nursery. Part of that is earth care and fair share. In fact, that's two thirds of the whole equation. So we have to deal with that. Um, Mark, thanks for the two bucks. Appreciate it very much. Is cannabis a plant you have any interest in? Sure, it's a very interesting plant. Uh, I don't think we'll be growing it necessarily until things feel very straightforward that you can grow it without any issues. Uh, we're public enough, public facing enough that it doesn't feel worth risking at all. And there's wonderful folks that grow, um, you know, medicinal CBD style cannabis now in New York State that we could have access to to make salves or to smoke if we wanted to. So uh, we haven't we haven't grown it. Um, broad shoulders from Sean. Can you coppice or pollard chestnuts and still get nuts? Yeah, for sure. When you cut back a nut or fruit bearing tree uh, as a coppice, which means flush to ground or pollard, which means above the browsing height of uh, the animals that may eat them, uh, they absolutely will produce again, but there's a delay. So let's say you've got 10 chestnuts and you want to manage them for both nuts and firewood. Maybe three of them, at once they're all producing age, three of them get cut as a pollard one year. And so then they'll regrow. And then their second and third year, they'll start making nuts again. And you can start pollarding the next ones and rotate that group. So you're always getting both young wood for poles and infrastructure and firewood, as well as some nuts at the same time. But yeah, they come back into production after uh, probably three years or so. Hazelnut, probably two years. Um, 
two to four come back into production after a coppicing or pilarding. Sarah, thank you. We really appreciate you being part of our community. That's really generous of you, and we appreciate it for sure. Um, cool. Boo -boo -boo. Um, well, Burke, I'm scrolling back through here a little bit. Uh, Burke has mentioning, um, your videos are instructive. Have you mentored anyone? If so, how did that go? Yeah, informally, we've had uh, volunteer relationships. Folks, some some folks, uh, my good, my now good friend Leo worked with me for probably two years or so off and on, and I shared tons and tons of information with them, and um, they've developed a beautiful food forest on their family's land. And it's been very informal the way we go. It's not like, a, you know, you sign up and this and that. Some people will come and volunteer for a day and then that's that. Um, and like, for example, our friend Juan has been working now for three years with us. And so we're trying to actually see what it looks like to include him in like a full and more formalized way. Is he a partner of Edible Acres now or what? Um, but we just kind of go at it in a loose way and. Uh, um, see how it evolves, but yeah. Um, Benny Rubber, are you ready for a world without bread? You don't grow any grains, right? Potatoes are more calorific in our latitude anyway, um, but I can't fathom the labor required for grain processing, milling, etc. Yeah, where we live, we're lucky to have some people that do amazing uh, organic annual grain production and really beautiful flower production. Uh, Farmer Ground Flower in uh, Trumansburg, New York is an incredible business. And so long as there's diesel and folks doing that sort of work, we'll continue to barter with them for great organic flour. We are also at the same time trying to really increase our chestnut production and collect more and more um, hazelnuts and different crops that we can, they're not going to be bred uh, necessarily, but um, starting to understand more and more working with these tree crops to to do that. But we would be very sad if sourdough bread was was completely gone. The fire. Um, okay, so this looks like a question that came through before. Jeff Lawton says certain trees such as, I'm not sure, and palm trees are able to fix or accumulate phosphate. I'm not familiar at all with trees that accumulate phosphate, sorry. Um, include pine trees. Cool, so Amy's asking, in one of your videos, you include pine trees in permaculture. What purpose does it serve? Um, I'm glad you, I'm glad he loves the videos and uh, that you do too. Yeah, we don't, we haven't planted pine trees uh, explicitly to include, it's basically the, on my folks land, the six acres up in Trumansburg, New York, there were a huge number of Scots pines and white pine that are there. And so what we're trying to do is whenever possible work with them. There's a thin few here or there, but leave a number up uh, in order to have windbreak and trellising and all those sorts of things. Uh, I haven't really planted pine trees as part of a permaculture design. I'm not against it, but with part of the idea is how do we work with what's already there? What, what context do we already have? Um, okay. Uh, Kalen is asking, there are 40 plus two to five foot pear tree suckers. Cut all of them down to the main tree thrives or harvest as rootstock, uh, but would have to graft to make worthy producers. Yeah, so the question here is about, um, the, it sounds like they've got a pear tree that's sending up tons and tons of, of suckers. And when you see suckers coming up around a pear or an apple or any grafted tree, that it's a reasonable assumption that that is uh, not a honey crisp or a bosk, it is the root stock that was grafted onto. And so yes, they could be root, um, you could, for example, uh, thin out a number of them and graft some pears onto those that you wanna leave and just simply let them continue to grow. If you're interested in having them as root stocks that are then moved elsewhere, you may consider thinning them a little bit this winter and then stooling 
collecting a bunch of compost and wood chips around those suckers this season so that they root into that material. You can graft onto them this spring. Um, and so as they're rooting, and then in the fall, check to see if they've rooted into that material that you've stooled around those suckers that you've grafted and see if you can't cut away nice six foot tall, eight foot tall grafted potomac or seckle pears that can then be transplanted elsewhere. That might be a neat way to work with the situation as it's being presented. Glenn is asking, do you think we'll see the American chestnut come, ba come back in our lives? I don't think we'll see widely distributed, true, natural, pure American chestnut. I think you'll see, and we already are, a really strong push for the American Chestnut Foundation's work with the GMO or the transgenic chestnut, which I have serious, serious concerns about. Um, they've figured out a way to intercross some of the germplasm or the genetic code of wheat to confer fungal resistance in the American chestnut. It just seems really sketchy. What I think you will see quite possibly, are beautiful, well-adapted, complex parentage, natural hybrid chestnuts with Chinese and American and European and Japanese and Korean mixed in different ratios that are appropriate for different bioregions and productive for hundreds and hundreds of years and exquisite in flavor and appropriate for moving into the new future that we have. So I don't see a pure natural American chestnut anytime but I see lots of promising mutts, basically. Um, Old Grow Homestead. My parents' black walnut tree is growing really slowly, 15 to 18 feet in 18-ish years. Any recommendations? Um, yeah, it sounds like they're, it's maybe the tree was planted and it's not exactly the site that they would like. Uh, black walnuts are heavy feeders. They tend to naturally come up in areas that are rich, moist bottomlands. So if it's not, uh, if it's a tree that was planted that they have intention of wanting to see grow well, give them some niceness. Give them a couple wheelbarrow loads of, of wood chips this spring and let them get a good uh, high organic matter, good even moisture in the soil and see if that doesn't support them. Uh, let's see, arcs and sparks welding. Did your big pond fill up at your folks? Not yet, uh, we'll, we'll have to see. It's, it's filled with snow. When the snow melts, we'll have to see what the actual water line is. The, the pond that we dug with the excavator in our neighbor's yard filled up pretty nicely. And then this winter it's leaking. And so I have to figure out where it's, what's happening there. So we'll share notes about all of our pond fiascos in the spring, I'm sure. It's cool, folks here, um, for those of you that are interested, there are a lot of people chiming in with really thoughtful, gentle recommendations of what can be really lovely about keeping pines in a landscape, since a question earlier came up about pine and permaculture. And yeah, they've got tons of vitamin C in their needles. Uh, even the, the on white pine, the interface or the cambium, basically, right under the bark ab above the sapwood, there's a little pink layer in there. It's like a the cambium layer. It's, it's, it's like a really nice piney resinous bubble gum you can even chew. So it doesn't blow bubbles, but it's something to chew on in the winter. Sweet and nice. Um, cool. Hopefully it feels like um, people are getting their questions answered for the most part. It seems like I might be getting caught up. We're pretty close to around an hour here. So I'm gonna, I'll wind it down pretty soon. <clears throat> um, but I see some more questions, so I'll answer them. Benny Rubber, have you noticed the delay in yields when applying mulch or biochar that absorbs nutrients? I've been applying mulch to our garden for three years. It's dominantly clay and I haven't seen a real return yet. Yeah, that's, I, it, there's no magic bullet there. I think, so if you add biochar to soil, the question needs to be, is it, has it been inoculated? Has it been pre-charged? Or is it just, if you just put straight crushed charcoal on the soil, it really does slow things down for a while. If you have charcoal that's been sitting in compost tea or involved in a hot composting process or with tons of urine in it, it, it contributes benefits, it feels like right away. Where I see the charcoal performing best, we have garden beds where it was added 
liberally about eight to 10 years ago, and those beds just grow beautifully. Things just really do well. Uh, so it's, it's a waiting game. It takes a little while for those things to evolve into place. And you probably already know this, but I'll just put it out there. Anytime you're adding things like charcoal or wood chips or any sort of mulch or nutrient that you're not exactly 100% sure how it will interact in the soil, my strong feeling is to not till it or incorporate it or force feed it into the soil, but deposit it on the surface and give it that patience. Let the soil life come up and work with it. And if you've gone really heavy on wood chips and you're not seeing great results yet, consider inoculating those wood chips with something like a wine cap mushroom or even just wild fungally looking wood chips or uh, pieces of material you find in the woods to give that fungal life to help start that breakdown process. Um, that's a nice question from Dave Taylor. When trying to increase your stock of genetic seed diversity, how far do you typically travel to find new trees to collect from? Do you just take a drive and see what happens? We're not opposed to collecting seed. You know, we do seed trades online. I buy seeds from different companies. Some, some are far away. Uh, we're very, very lucky that where we are, there, uh, Cornell has arboretums with all sorts of collections of trees, and there are a lot of neat farmers and orchards around here. So I've been very lucky to be able to find a lot of genetics right where we are. Uh, but if you're looking to save money and increase things quickly, put out the feelers and see if there are nurseries or orchards near where you live where you can volunteer in exchange for gleaning the drops or taking scion wood cuttings and, and learning those sorts of things. It's a nice way to work. Okay. Uh, one or two more questions, and then I'm going to wrap it up. So we'll we'll start winding down here. CEP, CEB, or Seb, thoughts on Seaberry as a productive nitrogen fixer? Yeah, they're amazing. They have to have full sun, um, otherwise they don't work. This winter, seeing how much rabbit and deer browse we've had, it's been really nice to see that under extreme herbivory, Seaberry seems to not be interesting to them at all so far lucky um but they're they're pretty aggressive they sucker and spread so you need to be careful with that or be excited about that um if you want to maintain them and have a single sea berry and then this and then that you're going to be sad probably but what i will uh, want to try this year is um planting annual hungry vining crops on the south side of sea berry and seeing how they fare as a fertilizing trellis. So what does it look like to have a female sea berry with cucumbers climbing up or winter squash sprawling over them? How well can they handle that? That'll be a nice test. Um, okay, I'm going to answer two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so don't be offended if I don't um, answer. Well, one that's very quick and easy, but I won't count it. Arcs and Sparks Welding. Spring local nursery sales? Question mark. Yes. So keep your eyes peeled for videos on that uh, or sign up for our newsletter at the main page of ediblacres.org and we'll certainly let you know about that. But we plan on doing spring sales for local folks for sure. Okay. Um, Mark is saying, I'm not strong enough to dig three feet deep for fruit trees. Is an auger the best tool for this job? It could be. You could also think about hiring uh, somebody that's younger or just getting into the work that needs a good... Um, a decent paying, you know, living wage to do that digging for and with you, that maybe you can pilot hole where you want it to go and have them do the rest. Um, but I, I've seen people have decent success with an auger. If you do use an auger, consider uh, breaking up a little bit, maybe with a mattock or a shovel, the edges. So you don't just have like a perfectly smooth cylindrical hole that you're planting into. You want a little bit more of a V open shape. Uh, this would be the last question, and sorry about that. Uh, could you share any interplanting experiences that have had less than successful results? Annual, perennial, mix, whatever feels worth mentioning. So many, boy. I wish I, uh, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think of specific examples of interplanting. Okay, here's one. Uh, hardy kiwi, not arctic kiwi, but hardy kiwi uh, growing on a chestnut tree. It's like, this is going to be genius. The chestnut's strong. It'll grow beautifully. That hardy kiwi is a straight strangler. I've uh, since learned hardy kiwi definitely needs to be on its own dedicated trellis. 
not growing on a tree you care about. If it's a tree you want to kill, great, grow it on, <laughs> grow it on there. Um, I think stinging nettle being introduced on the boundaries of some guilds, ooh, it'll be a beautiful, it'll protect from rabbits and deer and it'll stay over there. That doesn't, it, two, three years later, we've got raspberry patches that are just loaded with nettles. So that's pretty fun. Um, comfrey thinking, I, you know, I'm not, I'm digging, but I'm not digging too near comfrey. So I don't have to worry about it. And then that spreads all over the place. I feel like I could probably spend a good hour just trying to think through all the different epic fail, permaculture fails of those sorts of plants. But, you know, you learn as you go and none of them have been catastrophic. It's not, it's not that big a deal. Um, but, but yeah, it, it still, I still feel like it's very worthwhile experimenting every year with novel relationships of plants. And when they do go wrong, even that hardy kiwi on the chestnut, which was pretty tough on the chestnut, I've since caught up with pruning it back. And now I take all my hardwood cuttings from that kiwi every year and that keeps it in check and it actually is compatible so no, no harm no fail foul anyway um cool folks i really appreciate you all um being here we really i don't know it feels like a really lovely wonderful uh community that we're in and it's great to see a lot of faces and names that are familiar it's it, it does feel like a real like we're in a real community, not just this virtual thing. I mean, it is that too. Um, thank you all again. I think I'll probably wrap up here. Uh, if you were thinking it would be fun to join as a member uh, and that feels exciting and comfortable financially for you, that definitely goes a nice long way to keeping us motivated to, uh, I, I don't know if you noticed this, but like pretty much every single video ever that we put out any question that anyone has i try to answer fully um and as you can imagine that takes some time on some of the popular videos it's upwards to like 80 to 100 a day <laughs> so it takes some time but i feel pretty committed to doing that so for those of you that have joined as members or you know do the super chat thing and all that it it really helps a lot so all right thank you all we'll next time i'll try to actually uh make a, a plan more than like six hours in advance. It's cool that over a hundred people decided to join us this evening randomly here. So the next one I'll, I'll, I'll think about a, a week in advance. And if you have um, really specific topics that feel important to you that you'd like to see covered in one of these live Q and A sessions, when I end this tonight, put it in the comments of the video once it's posted there. Okay, that is all. Thank you all. Have a lovely evening. Take care.